Moby Dick, or, The Whale, by Herman Melville. Chapter 116. The Dying Whale. Not seldom in this life, when, on the right side, fortune's favorites sail close by us, we, though all a droop before, catch somewhat of the rushing breeze, and joyfully feel our bagging cells fill out. So seemed it with the Pequot. For next day after encountering the gay bachelor, whales were seen and four were slain, and one of them by Ahab. It was far down the afternoon, and when all the spearings of the crimson fight were done, and floating in the lovely sunset sea and sky, sun and whale both stilly died together, then, such a sweetness and such plaintiveness, such in wreathing orisons curled up in that rosy air, that it almost seemed as if far over from the deep green convent valleys of the Manila Isles, the Spanish land breeze, wantonly turned, sailor, had gone to sea, freighted with these vesper hams. Soothed again, but only soothed to deeper gloom, Ahab, who had sterned off from the whale, sat intently watching his final wanings from the now tranquil boat. For that strange spectacle observable in all sperm whales dying, the turning sunwards of the head, and so expiring, that strange spectacle, beheld of such a placid evening, somehow to Ahab conveyed a wondrousness unknown before. He turns and turns him to it comma how slowly, but how steadfastly, his homage rendering and invoking brow, with his last dying motions. He too worships fire, most faithful, broad, baronial vassal of the sun exclamation Marco that these two favoring eyes should see these two favoring sights. Look! Here, far water locked, beyond all hum of human weal or woe, in these, most candid and impartial seas, where to traditions no rocks furnish tablets, where for long Chinese ages, the billows have still rolled on speechless and unspoken to as stars that shine upon the Niger's unknown source, here, too, life dies sunwards full of faith, but see. No sooner dead, than death whirls round the corpse, and it heads some other way. Oh, thou dark Hindu half of nature, who of, drowned bones hast builded thy separate throne somewhere in the heart of these unverdered seas, thou art an infidel, thou queen, and who truly speakest to me in the wide slaughtering typhoon and the hushed burial of its after calm. Nor has this thy whale sunwards turned his dying head, and then gone round again, without a lesson to me. Oh, trebly hooped and welded hip of power. Oh, high, aspiring, rainbow jet exclamation mark that one strivest, this one jettest all in vain. In vain, O oh whale, dost thou seek intercedings with yon all-quickening sun, that only calls forth life, but gives it not again. Yet dost thou, darker half, rock me with a prouder, if a darker faith. All thy unnameable minglings float beneath me here, I am buoyed by breaths of once living things, exhaled as air, but water, now. Then hail, forever hail, O sea, in whose eternal tossings the wild fowl finds his only rest. Born of earth, yet suckled by the sea, though hill and valley mothered me, ye billows are my foster brothers. Chapter 117. The Whale Watch. The four whales slain that evening had died wide apart, one, far to windward, one, less distant, to leeward, one ahead, one astern. These last three were brought alongside ere nightfall, but the windward one could not be reached till morning, and the boat that had killed it lay by its side all night, and that boat was Ahab's. The wave pole was thrust upright into the, dead whale's spout hole, and the lantern hanging from its top, cast a troubled flickering glare upon the black, glossy back, and far out upon the midnight waves, which gently chafed the whale's broad flank, like soft surf upon a beach. Ahab and all his boats grew seen to sleep but the Parsee, who crouching in the bow, sat watching the sharks, that spectrally played round the whale, and tapped the, light cedar planks with their tails. A sound like the moaning in squadrons over asphalt heights of unforgiven ghosts of Gamora, ran shuddering through the air. Started from his slumbers, Ahab, face to face, saw the Parsee, and hooped round by the gloom of the night they seemed the last men in a flooded world. I have dreamed it again, said he. Of the hearses? Have I not said, old man, that neither, hearse nor coffin can be thine? 
and who are hers that die on the sea. But I said, Old man, that ere thou couldst die on this voyage, two hearses must verily be seen by thee on the sea, the first not made by mortal hands, and the visible wood of the last one must be grown in America. Aye, aye. A strange sight that, Parsi colon a hearse and its plumes floating over the ocean with the waves for, the pallbearers. Ha! Such a sight we shall not soon see. Believe it or not, thou canst not die till it be seen, old man. And what was that saying about thyself? Though it come to the last, I shall still go before thee the eye pilot. And when thou art so gone before, if that ever befall, then ere I can follow, thou must still appear to me, to pilot me still question mark was it not so? Well, then, did I, believe all ye say, O my pilot. I have here two pledges that I shall yet slay Moby Dick and survive it. Take another pledge, old man, said the Parsee, as his eyes lighted up like fireflies in the gloom, him only can kill thee. The gallows, ye mean dot I am immortal then, on land and on sea, cried Ahab, with a laugh of derision, immortal on land and on sea. Both were silent again, as one, man. The great dawn came on and the slumbering crew arose from the boat's bottom, and ere noon the dead whale was brought to the ship. What? Chapter 118 The Quadrant The season for the line at length drew near, and every day when Ahab, coming from his cabin, cast his eyes aloft, the vigilant helmsman would ostentatiously handle his spokes, and the eager mariners quickly run to the braces and would stand there with all their eyes centrally fixed on the nail doubloon, impatient for the order to point the ship's prow for the equator. In good time the order came. It was hard upon high noon, and Ahab, seated in the bows of his high-hoisted boat, was about taking his wonted daily observation of the sun to determine his latitude. Now, in that Japanese sea, the days in summer are as fresh as of effulgences. That unblinkingly vivid Japanese sun seems the blazing focus of the glassy ocean's immeasurable burning glass. The sky looks, lacquered, clouds there are none, the horizon floats, and this nakedness of unrelieved radiance is as the insufferable splendors of God's throne. Well that Ahab's quadrant was furnished with colored glasses, through which to take sight of that solar fire. So, swinging his seated form to the roll of the ship, and with his astrological looking instrument placed to his eye, he remained in that posture for some moments to catch the precise instant when the sun should gain its precise meridian. Meantime, while his whole attention was absorbed, the Parsee was kneeling beneath him on the ship's deck, and with face thrown up like Ahab's, was eyeing the same sun with him, only the lids of his eyes half hooded their orbs, and his wild face was subdued to an earthly passionlessness. At length, the desired observation was taken, and with his pencil upon his ivory leg, Ahab soon calculated what his latitude must be at that precise instant. Then falling into a moment's reverie, he again looked up towards the sun and murmured to himself, Thou see Mark! Thou high and mighty pilot! Thou tellest me truly where I am, but canst thou cast the least hint where I shall be? Or canst thou tell where, some other thing besides me is this moment living? Where is Moby Dick? This instant thou must be eyeing him. These eyes of mine look into the very eye that is even now beholding him, I, and into the eye that is even now equally beholding the objects on the unknown, thither side of thee, thou son. Then gazing at his squadrant, and handling, one after the other, its numerous cabalistical contrivances, he pondered again, and muttered, Foolish toy! Baby's plaything of haughty admirals, and commodores, and captains, the world brags of thee, of thy cunning and might, but what after all canst thou do, but tell the poor, pitiful point, where thou thyself happenest to be on this wide planet, and the hand that holds thee, no, not one jot more. Thou canst not tell where one drop of water, or one grain of scent will be tomorrow noon, and yet with thy impotence thou insultest the sun. Science. Curse thee, thou vain toy and cursed be all the things that cast man's eyes aloft to that heaven, whose live vividness but scorches him, as these old eyes are even now scorched with thy light, O sun. Level by nature to this earth's horizon are the glances of man's eyes, not shot from the crown, of his head, 
as if God had meant him to gaze on his firmament. Curse thee, thou quadrant! Dashing it to the deck, no longer will I guide my earthly way by thee, the level ship's compass, and the level dead reckoning, by log and by line, thee shall conduct me, and show me my place on the sea. I, lighting from the boat to the deck, thus I trample on thee, thou paltry thing that feebly, pointest on high, thus I split and destroy thee. As the frantic old man thus spoke and thus trampled with his live and dead feet, a sneering triumph that seemed meant for Ahab, and a fatalistic despair that seemed meant for himself, these passed over the mute, motionless Parsi's face. Unobserved he rose and glided away, while, awestruck by the aspect of their commander, the seamen clustered, together on the forecastle, till Ahab, troubledly pacing the deck, shouted out, to the braces. Up helm! Square inches! In an instant the yards swung round, and as the ship half wheeled upon her heel, her three firm seated graceful masts directly poised upon her long, ribbed hull, seemed as the three hurry to pirouetting on one's efficient steed. Standing between the night heads, Starbuck watched the Pequod's tumultuous way, and Ahab's also, as he went lurching along the deck. I have sat before the dense coal fire and watched it all aglow, full of its tormented flaming life, and I have seen it wane at last down, down, to dumbest dust. Old man of oceans! Of all this fiery life of thine, what will at length remain but one little heap of ashes? I, cried Stubb, but see coal ashes, mind ye, that, Mr. Starbuck, see coal, not your common charcoal. Well, well, I heard Ahab mutter, here some one thrusts these cards into these old hands of mine, swears that I must play them, and no others. And damn me, Ahab, but thou actest right, live in the game, and die in it. Chapter 119 The Candles Warmest climbs but nurse the cruelest fangs, the tiger of Bengal crouches in spiced groves of ceaseless verdure. Skies the most effulgent but basket the deadliest thunders, gorgeous Cuba nose tornadoes that never swept tame northern lands. So, too, it is, that in these resplendent Japanese seas the mariner encounters the direst of all storms, the typhoon. It will, sometimes burst from out that cloudless sky, like an exploding bomb upon a dazed and sleepy town. Towards evening of that day, the Pequod was torn of her canvas, and Bearpold was left to fight a typhoon which had struck her directly ahead. When darkness came on, sky and sea roared and split with the thunder, and blazed with the lightning that showed the disabled masts fluttering here and there, with the rags which the first fury of the tempest had left for its after-sport. Holding by a shroud, Starbuck was standing on the quarter-deck, at every flash of the lightning glancing aloft, to see what additional disaster might have befallen the intricate hamper there, while Stubb and Flask were directing the men in the higher hoisting and firmer lashing of the boats. But all their pains seemed, not. Though lifted to the very top of the cranes, the windward quarter boat, Ahab's, did not escape. A great rolling sea, dashing high up against the reeling ship's high teetering side, stove in the boat's bottom at the stern, and left it again, all dripping through like a sieve. Bad work, bad work. Mr. Starbuck, said Stubb, regarding the wreck, but the sea will have its way. Stubb, for one, can't fight it. You see, Mr. Starbuck. A wave has such a great long start before it leaps, all round the world it runs, and then comes the spring. But as for me, all the start I have to meet it, is just across the deck here. But never mind, it's all in fun, so the old song says, Dash sings, oh. Jolly is the gale, and a joker is the whale, a flourish in his tail, such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, pokey pokey lad, is the ocean, oh. The scud all a flyin', that's his flip only foeman, when he stirs in the spicin', such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, pokey pokey lad, is the ocean, oh. Thunder splits the ships, but he only smacks his lips, a tastin' of this flip, such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, pokey pokey lad, is the ocean, oh. A vast stub, cried Starbuck, let the typhoon, sing and strike his harp here in our rigging, 
but if thou art a brave man thou wilt hold thy peace. But I am not a brave man, never said I was a brave man, I am a coward, and I sing to keep up my spirits. And I tell you what it is, Mr. Starbuck, there's no way to stop my singing in this world but to cut my throat. And when that's done, ten to one I sing e the doxology for a wind-up. Madman, look through my eyes if thou hast none of thine own. What? How can you see better of a dark night than anybody else, never mind how foolish? Here! cried Starbuck, seizing Stubb by the shoulder, and pointing his hand towards the weather bow, Markest thou not that the gale comes from the eastward, the very course Ahab is to run from Obi Dick? The very course he swung to this day noon? Now mark, his boat there, where is that stove? In the stern sheets, man, where he is wont to stand, his standpoint is stove, man. Now jump overboard, and sing away, if thou must. I don't half understand ye, what's in the wind? Yes, yes, round the Cape of Good Hope is the shortest way to Nantucket, soliloquized Starbuck suddenly, heedless of Stubbs' question. The gale that now hammers at us to stave us, we can turn it into a fair wind that will drive us towards home. Yonder, to windward, all is blackness of doom, but to leeward, homeward, I see it lightens up there, but not with the lightning. At that moment in one of the intervals of profound darkness, following the flashes, a voice was heard at his side, and almost at the same instant a volley of thunder peals rolled overhead. Who's there, old thunder? said Ahab, groping his way along the bulwarks to his pivot hole, but suddenly finding his path made plain to him by elbowed lances of fire. Now, as the lightning rod to aspire on shore is intended to carry off the perilous fluid into the soil, so the kinder rod which I see some ships carry to each mast, is intended to conduct it into the water. But as this conductor must descend, to considerable depth, that its end may avoid all contact with the hull, and as moreover, if kept constantly towing there, it would be liable to many mishaps, besides interfering not a little with some of the rigging, and more or less impeding the vessel's way in the water, because of all this, the lower parts of a ship's lightning rods are not always overboard, but are generally made in long, slender links, so as to be the more readily hauled up into the chains outside, or thrown down into the sea, as occasion may require. The rods! The rods! cried Starbuck to the crew, suddenly admonished to vigilance by the vivid lightning that had just been darting flambukes, to light Ahab to his post. Are they overboard? Drop them over, fore and aft. Quick! Avast! cried Ahab, let's have fair, play here, though we be the weaker side. Yet I'll contribute to raise rods on the Himalayas and Andes, that all the world may be secured, but out on privileges. Let them be, sir. Look aloft! cried Starbuck. The corpusants! The corpusants! All the yard arms were tipped with a pallid fire, and touched at each tri pointed lightning rod in with three tapering white flames, each of the three tall masts was silently burning in that sulphurous air, like three gigantic wax tapers before an altar. Blast the boat! Let it go! cried Stubb at this instant, as a swashing sea heaved up under his own little craft so that it scunnel violently jammed his hand, as he was passing a lashing. Blast it! But slipping backward on the deck, his uplifted eyes caught the flames, and immediately shifting, his tone he cried, The corpusants have mercy on us all. To sailors, oaths or household words, they will swear in the trance of the calm, and in the teeth of the tempest, they will imprecate curses from the top sail yard arms, when most they teeter over to a seething sea but in all my voyagings, seldom have I heard a common oath when God's burning finger has been laid on the ship, when his mean, mean, tequila farson has been woven into the shrouds in the cordage. While this pallidness was burning aloft, few words were heard from the enchanted crew, who in one thick cluster stood on the forecastle, all their eyes gleaming in that pale phosphorescence, like a faraway constellation of stars. Relieved against the ghostly light, the gigantic jet negro, Dagu, loomed up to thrice his real, stature, and seemed the black cloud from which the thunders had come. The parted mouth of Tashka revealed his sharp white teeth, which strangely gleamed as if they too had been tipped by corpusants, while lit up by the preternatural light, 
Guigek statuing burned like satanic blue flames on his body. The tableau all waned at last with the pallidness aloft, and once more the peak widened every soul on her decks were wrapped in a pall. A moment or two passed, when Starbuck, going forward, pushed against someone. It was Stubb. What thinkest thou now, man, I heard thy cry, it was not the same in the song. No, no, it wasn't, I said the corpusants have mercy on us all, and I hope they will, still. But do they only have mercy on long faces question mark have they no bowels for a laugh? And look ye, Mr. Starbuck, but it's too dark to look. Hear me, then, I take that masthead flame we saw for a sign of good luck for those masts are rooted in a hold that is going to be truck a block with sperm oil, GC, and so, all that sperm will work up into the masts, like sap in a tree. Yes, our three masts will yet be as three sperm a city candles, that's the good promise we saw. At that moment, Starbuck caught sight of Stubb's face slowly beginning to glimmer into sight. Glancing upwards, he cried, See! See! and once more the high tapering flames were beheld with what seemed redoubled supernaturalness in their pallor. The corpusants have mercy on us all, cried Stubb, again. At the base of the main mast, full beneath the doubloon and the flame, the Parsi was kneeling in Ahab's front, but with his head bowed away from him, while nearby, from the arched and overhanging rigging, where they had just been engaged securing a spar, a number of the seamen, arrested by the glare, now cohered together, and hung pendulous, like a knot of numbed wasps from a drooping, orchard twig. In various enchanted attitudes, like the standing, or stepping, or running skeletons in Herculaneum, others, remain rooted to the deck, but all their eyes upkissed. I, I, men! cried Ahab. Look up at it, mark it well, the white flame but lights the way to the white whale. Hand me those mainmast links there, I would fain feel this pulse, and let mine beat against it, blood against fire. So. Then turning, the last link held fast in his left hand, he put his foot upon the parsi, and with fixed upward, eye, and high-flung right arm, he stood erect before the lofty tripoint trinity of flames. Oh! Thou clear spirit of clear fire, whom on these seas I as Persian once did worship, till in the sacramental act so burned by thee, that to this hour I bear the scar. I now know thee, thou clear spirit, and I now know that thy right worship is defiance. To neither love nor reverence wilt thou be kind, and e'en for hate thou canst but kill, and all are killed. No fearless fool now fronts thee. I own thy speechless, placeless power, but to the last gasp of my earthquake life will dispute its unconditional, unintegral mastery in me. In the midst of the personified impersonal, a personality stands here though but a point at best, whensoever I came, wheresoever I go, yet while I earthly live, the queenly personality lives in me, and feels her royal rights. But war is pain, and hate is woe. Come in thy lowest form of love, and I will kneel and kiss thee, but at thy highest, come as mere supernal power, and though thou launchest navies of full freighted worlds, there's that in here that still, remains indifferent. Oh, thou clear spirit! Of thy fire thou maddest me, and like a true child of fire, I breathe it back to thee. Sudden, repeated flashes of lightning, the nine flames leap lengthwise to thrice their previous height, Ahab, with the rest, closes his eyes, his right hand pressed hard upon them, I own thy speechless, placeless power, said I not so? Nor was it wrung from me, nor, do I now drop these links. Thou canst blind, but I can then grope. Thou canst consume, but I can then be ashes. Take the homage of these poor eyes, and shut her hands. I would not take it. The lightning flashes through my skull, mine eyeballs ache and ache, my whole beaten brain seems as beheaded, and rolling on some stunning ground. Oh, oh! Yet blindfold, yet will I talk to thee. Light though, thou be, thou leapest out of darkness, but I am darkness leaping out of light, leaping out of thee. The javelin cease, open eyes, see, or not? There burn the flames. Oh, thou magnanimous! Now I do glory in my genealogy. But thou art but my fiery father, my sweet mother, I know not. Oh, cruel! 
What hast thou done with her? There lies my puzzle, but thine is greater. Thou knowest not how came ye. Hence callest thyself unbegotten, certainly knowest not thy beginning, hence callest thyself unbegun. I know that of me, which thou knowest not of thyself, O, oh, thou omnipotent. There is some one suffusing thing beyond thee, thou clear spirit, to whom all thy eternity is but time, all thy creativeness mechanical. Through thee, thy flaming self, my scorched eyes do dimly see it. O, oh, thou foundling, fire! Thou hermit immemorial, thou too hast thy incommunicable riddle, thy unparticipated grief. Here again with haughty agony, I read my sire. Leap. Leap up, and lick the sky. I leap with thee, I burn with thee, would fain be welded with thee, defyingly I worship thee. The boat. The boat. Cried Starbuck, look at thy boat, old man. Ahab's harpoon, the one forged at Perth's fire, remained firmly lashed in its conspicuous crotch, so that it projected beyond his whaleboat's bow, but the sea that had stove its bottom had caused the loose leather sheath to drop off, and from the keen steel barb there now came a leveled flame of pale, forked fire. As the silent harpoon burned there like a serpent's tongue, Starbuck grasped Ahab by the arm, God, God is against thee, old man, forbear, tis an ill voyage. Ill begun, ill continued. Let me square the yards, while we may, old man, and make a fair wind of it homewards, to go on a better voyage than this. Overhearing Starbuck, the panic stricken crew instantly ran to the braces, though not a sail was left aloft. For the moment, all the aghast mate's thoughts seemed theirs, they raised a half mutinous cry. But dashing the rattling, lightning links to the deck, and snatching the burning harpoon, Ahab waved him like a torch among them swearing to transfix with it the first sailor that but cast loose a rope's end. Petrified by his aspect, and still more shrinking from the fiery dart that he held, the men fell back in dismay, and Ahab again spoke, All your oaths to hunt the white whale are as binding as mine, and heart, soul, and body, lungs and life, old Ahab is bound. And that ye may know to what tune this heart beats, look ye here, thus I blow out the last fear and with one blast of his breath he extinguished the flame. As in the hurricane that sweeps the plain, men fly the neighborhood of some lone, gigantic helm, whose very height and strength but render it so much the more unsafe, because so much the more remark, for thunderbolts, so at those last words of Ahab's many of the mariners did run from him in a terror. Chapter 120 the deck towards the end of the first night watch. Ahab standing by the helm. Starbuck approaching him. We must send down the main top sail yard, sir. The bend is working loose and the lee lift is half stranded. Shall I strike it, sir? Strike nothing, lash it. If I had sky sail poles, I'd sway them up now. Sir exclamation mark and God's name exclamation marks sir. Well. The anchors are working, sir. Shall I get them in board? Strike nothing, and stir nothing, but lash everything. The wind rises, but it has not got up to my table lens yet. Quick, and see to it dot by masts and keels. He takes me for the hunchback skipper of some coasting smack. Send down my main topsail yard. Ho, glue pots. Loftiest trucks were made for wildest winds, and this brain truck of mine now sails amid the clouds cud. Shall. I strike that? Oh, none but cowards sent down their brain trucks in tempest time. What a ha a shell off there. I would e'en take it for sublime, did I not know that the colic is a noisy malady. Oh, take medicine, take medicine.